yourself at the standard model, it doesn't really work if um, without the Higgs, which is a big problem, <laughs> um, because you need to solve it, right? So in quantum mechanics, it's really hard to have particles that have um, multiple spins, uh, spin one particles. Mm -hmm. And you need spin one particles for things that don't have to do with very high energy physics, like beta decay and things like that. Um, and it turns out that there is a way to make it so that um, massless particles um, can exist, and it's called uh, non-Abelian gauge theory, uh, and it's also called Bing's field theory. So that's kind of like the equation that solved it, but that's also what gives rise to the Higgs mechanism and why we need it. Um, so why is it is that the electroweak force and electromagnetic force, they're so different? Um, but if you look back at the standard model, you see that um, proton, which mediates the electromagnetic force, doesn't have any mass, while the W and Z bosons mediate the weak force have a lot of mass. Uh, and we need to figure out why that is. And so it turns out it's because electroweak symmetry breaking, which is a little bit complicated. But basically, um, the Higgs potential, which is the Higgs field, um, um, it has a degenerate ground state. And it seems a little bit complicated, but I'll, I'll explain it later. It's, it's actually not that complicated. Um, but we know that. Like, we know that that happens. And then the existence of the Higgs field requires there to be at least one Higgs particle. And this is why we look for this particle. Because if without it, the standard model, which explains literally everything that's around us, the universe, how it, how it works, needs it. And so the theory says it, and now we have to find it. So in basic here, then, you have a specific energy density particle. Uh, this is not math. It's just a rough approximation. Um, we have an electric field squared this is the magnetic field squared. And the minimum energy density occurs with the field basically uh, when E equals to zero. But for the Higgs field, it's different. It basically, uh, the energy density looks like this. You have the field minus the constant squared. And so the minimum de energy density occurs when E equals to constant. So that means that the Higgs field looks like this. And it's the degenerate, right? It doesn't like to be up there. It wants to go down. Uh, and this is what causes spontaneous symmetry breaking. And this field couples to three of the uh, electroweak gauge bosons, which were the ones that we saw, the Ws and Zs. And that's what gives them mass. Um, and the remaining gauge bosons, like the photon, doesn't have any mass. Okay. So now I'll get to the fun part. <laughs> Just a little bit of theory, because this is why we're even doing this. So what is CERN? Okay, so CERN is uh, a laboratory, a particle physics laboratory in Geneva, Switzerland. It's on the Franco-Swiss border. Um, and it was basically built in order to test these theories that were made, you know, like 50 years ago that clearly the theories come up with, but we need to test them because we need to see. And it's basically 27 kilometers in diameter, and it's about 100 meters underground. And um, they have a lot of cool physics. So this is the actual machine. So I'll tell you a little bit about how it works. Basically what they do is, it's a, called a Large Hadron Collider. So hadrons are part of the standard model and they're basically protons um, as a subset of hadrons. And they're basically fed into a linear accelerator and then um, accelerated and then they go. When you have uh, particles that have any intrinsic mass, like mass of their own, like non-zero mass, um, you basically, if you give them more energy, they gain more mass if they approach the speed of light. And this is what we're doing. So at CERN, what happens is that you have these protons that are fed into uh, kind of five stages. Uh, they go into a uh, proton synchrotron, and they're accelerated very much using alternating magnetic uh, electric fields to give them more energy. And then they're put, um, well actually they go to the booster first. And by the time they get to um, the super proton synchrotron, these names are so original, um, <laughs> they are going very, very, very quickly. So they're going about like 99.99% the speed of light, which means that there's this really fundamental equation in physics um, that was kind of made by Einstein. So it says that E equals mt squared, right? 
So you have these protons that have a specific mass. And so if you move, say, M to the other side, um, and you're moving them to the sp at the speed of light, which is what this accelerator does, they're going to get heavier, a lot, a lot, a lot heavier. And um, when you're accelerating them, the protons, basically by the end, they were, they're accelerated up to 17 meter uh, energies, which is very, very high. And um, basically by the time that they're about to collide, they're about like seven times their rest mass, the protons. And so this creates a very, very extreme collision. And the reason why we even do this is because it's trying to basically recreate the moment of uh, Collisions kind of that happened after the Big Bang, which was a lot of, a lot of energy. Um, because if we're able to recreate these conditions, we're able to learn a lot about the origin of the universe, the origin of why, why do we behave the way we do, like particles. So a little bit about uh, the accelerator. It has energy beams, so the maximum energy that they can go is actually 14 TeV. But in 2008, they had actually an explosion. And so they took out a bunch of magnets, um, magnets around themselves. And so they can't operate it at full temperature because something bad might happen. <laughs> and um, it has a very high luminosity, basically. Um, um, and the way that you're able to move these protons at a very high energy, uh, high speeds is that obviously you're accelerating them with electric fields, but you also uh, are steering them with magnetic fields with very superconducting magnets. A lot of them, like thousands of them, um, and it makes them go very fast. <laughs> okay. So then I'll talk a little bit about the detector, the Atlas detector. So it's very big, right? I mean, like that's a dinosaur. <laughs> so, um, so it's basically made of detectors that are inside of one another, um, and each detector detects things differently. So when you have these particles, basically they're going around a lot, a lot of, it takes about like half an hour, right? And you have a lot of protons, like 10 to the lot of protons. Um, and you have them, when they collide, <coughs> you have all of this energy and all of this mass. Um, and this mass, which is now 70 EV, so 7 trillion electron volts, a lot of electron volts. Uh, oh, by the way, T EVs are another way of saying mass, because mass and energy are interchangeable. So TEV simply means, uh, 1 EV is the amount of the, the voltage that you need to move one electron across one potential load. It's a word. But um, basically, it, it means mass, but it also means energy. So 7 TEVs is the collision of two of them, so 14 TV is total energy. And when you have this, you're basically creating matter inside of this detector. Um, so you have the inner detector. And the inner detector, what it does is that um, it, it basically, it's, it's able to trap charged particles and it bends them um, with its magnetic field and it looks at the energy and the momentum of the charged particles. Um, and then you have the calorimeters, which look at, um, me they basically measure mainly the energies of electrons and protons, because um, they interact electromagnetically. And then you have, actually, the muon detector. The muon detector is pretty important because muons don't typically, muons are kind of more of a heavier, another generation of electrons, and they're heavier. And they typically don't interact a lot, so they'll pass right through the calorimeter, uh, right through all the systems. And clearly, if you're having a lot, a lot of protons colliding, there's going to be a lot of collisions. Uh, about a billion collisions per second. Uh, and so these are more statistics. So it's basically like an 80 million pixel camera. And it takes a lot of pictures per second, but that's a lot of data. And so we can't like keep all that data. Right? <laughs> it's like, like sorority recruitment, you know, it's like, Sorry guys, we can't keep all of you guys. Um, so, so it's equipped with um, uh, a trigger system that basically looks at events that are interesting. So it has 
filter, <laughs> the one, uh, trigger one, and, uh, level one and level two, and finally an event filter. And it filters it down to about 200 um, interactions per, per second, which is really good because otherwise, you know, like Atlas looks at information, um, all of the data that it gets, and it's about like 160 million books per year. Uh, it's a lot, a lot, a lot. So what does an event actually look like? So this is CMS. <laughs> And this is a hate to again again. So when you have all this energy and you're putting into uh, this, this detector, <coughs> it basically, the hate couples to, like I said in the field before, all of the fields kind of can interchange between one another, right? And it's gonna, oh, sorry, it's gonna couple to two photons. Gamma, gamma, gamma is mean photons. And so you can see their paths right here. <coughs> And um, this is like collision. These are the other the other particles. And so, basically, what a Higgs search analysis essentially boils down to is searching for certain patterns in um, particles. That's great when when you collide them. Because, um, of course, like in this this type of physics, quantum mechanics reigns. So there's a lot of uh, uncertainty. But the standard model predicts that the Higgs should decay to specific specific. Um, products. Um, and so that's what we're doing. So we have to collide a lot, a lot of things to, to see what are the insecure products and, and um, what do they actually mean. Right? Um, okay. So when the Higgs decays into two photons, like right here, um, these bumps arise because the Higgs has a mass of about 100 And when it decays into two photons, um, Okay, so let me talk about why is it so hard to find. Because the mass of the Higgs is a free parameter, it took a lot of time to find because you didn't really <laughs> know where, or, because it could be anywhere. Because the center model doesn't predict the, the weight, the, the mass of the Higgs. Like it doesn't predict the other one, just either. So right here, I know I'm throwing up plots, but I'm gonna spin it, it's simple. Um, you have the um, scattering cross section, which is basically like the probability of something Lighting, and it's 10 to the 8. So when you're making these collisions, 99.9% of the time, nothing really happens. So they just collide and they hit and nothing, nothing interesting happens anyways. And then you go a little bit down and you have like the construction and the case to a uh, bottom part. And then all the way at the bottom, you have the cross section for the case at 150. And that's an order of magnitude, like 10 to the 2 compared to like 10 to the 8. And so you'll get a Higgs about like 1 every like 10 billion collisions. So it's not, you know, that often. And you need to collide a lot, a lot of things in order for it to happen. And so what does a Higgs decay look like? Like I said, you have, if, you, if anyone has any questions, anyways, you can always ask. Uh, you have um, these gluons, so gluon is um, what's inside the proton. Uh, so you have these protons decaying them very, uh, very quickly. And a gluon fusion is one of the most uh, common ones that, that happens because the Higgs has strong positive power. Of course, there will be good pick up protons. And you have this decay, it's called gluon fusion. And you also have vector boson fusion, which is the Higgs coupling to vector bosons, which are these Z and W uh, bosons. And so that's what a Higgs decay looks like. Very cool. And so what happened? So <laughs> on the 4th of July, oh, that should say 2012. Okay. Um, kind of, it was a really big deal, actually, because what happened is that they had been colliding these things for a very long time now, and nothing, literally no one was happening. But these are two independent projects that were being, uh, that occurred at the LHC. Basically, they both announced with a very high significance that they had found a new boson with uh, about 125 GP mass, which is pretty cool <coughs> and pretty important. And this is from Atlas. And 
this one was from CMS, which are two particle accelerators there. And so after that happened, um, we kind of like all went like that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, and so like July 5th, you know, like I made an appointment to at St. Works and I got uh, I got this baby done. Uh, so the glue on fusion to the Higgs. Um, yeah, the family wasn't too uh, happy about that one. But uh, it's going to be really awkward if we're like actually all wrong about this. It's just like... Um, and so, um, basically, this, what, what it says is that... Um, now we can explain, <laughs> we know that this uh, standard model actually pretty much makes sense. Right? If all of the pieces fit together, the proposal was the last one of the pieces that we needed in order to uh, uh, make this make sense. And so this is what it looks like. It's you know, kind of exciting if you look at it, because basically when you're looking for a Higgs and Higgs cell, so it just Higgs together. So when a Higgs and Higgs into two photons, um, Basically, what you're looking at is that uh, when it decays to two photons, uh, there should be more two photon events uh, with a mass of 120 feet, 25 GeV that you would expect if the Higgs wasn't there at all. So this is the curve of what you would expect, but there's clearly an excess, excess here at 125 GeV, which means that there's something there. Uh, and these bumps are like the resonances, depending on the theoretical predicted probabilities um, so that's really important. And the vector boson fusion, uh, not this one, the other one, uh, is really important because it's a powerful probe of electron weak symmetry breaking. Because what it says is that, um, in a simple way, <laughs> uh, it's sensitive to um, the Higgs basically coupling to the heavy top quark, like I mentioned, um, which are. Um, the gauge bosons, like Ws, and, and the masses are tightly related on the electron weak scale. So the fact that we know that these Higgs is with a vector boson, you know, decaying to a vector boson, kind of proves more than one theory, more than one theory that Higgs, the Higgs is mass, and then also that you know, those other things. And so that was, this is CMS, and then this is Atlas, which displayed the same thing around, uh, around the same energy. And uh, you know, these cost nine billion dollars uh, <laughs> to make. And I mean, if you like, if, if that's a price tag to understand the universe, I mean, I think it's worth it. Yeah. So what's next? Um, this is actually this is what I did on Valentine's Day. Um, they shut down for the next two years uh, the Higgs because of uh, the LHC because of their now going to renovate. When they had that explosion in 2008, they don't want it to happen again. And they had to operate at half, half energy. So now they're going to go all the way to 14 TVs, which is a lot, a lot of energy. But basically, this is like the end of physics. Yeah. All right. Um, and so some more things that we want to test is, is this the standard model Higgs? Is this boson actually? Uh, they have, there have been more tests. And again, searching for the Higgs is not the only experiment going on at, 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 uh, at CERN. There's a lot of other experiments that are very important. And we want to be able to see the Higgs decay to leptons, so to BB bar and tau tau, because it, we, these are uh, different types of particles. I mean, it would further our understanding of this, this, um, uh, the center bubble. And then also we want to prepare for the fortune TVs in 2015. And then we also want to see the unification of forces, right? So. You know, when you have a very high energies, forces tend to couple more. So the electromagnetic force and the weak force right now are two different forces. But if you go and you collide with very high energies particles, they tend they like unify, you know, which is really interesting, right? Right. <laughs> um, and so as you, if, if we're able to get higher higher energies, we can try to find more unification of more more types of energy. So the electric model <coughs> right here. These are forces like electricity and magnetism that happen right now, um, and the nuclear forces, and like the standard model. So the 
things like super symmetric theories can help us with that. Um, and also, the standard model predicts everything that we see around us right now. Basically, like literally everything. But it's really not the only thing in the universe. So where this blue? So out of the entire universe, we don't make up that much. And dark matter and dark energy are very important, but we don't understand them. But the LHC can also help us learn more about this because supersymmetry um, is a kind of a reflection of the standard model, but for dark matter. And at the LHC, we should be able to observe some of these particles. And hopefully, you know, in the future, and, and right now, which I'll look at, obviously they shut down yesterday, but um, there can be, and it can solve a hierarchy problem, the differences between um, the scale of gravity and the uh, yeah, dark matter. And then quantum gravity. So like I said, the gravity isn't included in the standard model, which is kind of necessary, right? You kind of experience it. And is string theory the answer to that? We don't know. Um, and then dark matter and uh, antimatter symmetry. So there's still a lot to learn from colliding things at really high energies. So and it's worth the money investing in it. So, the, the, yeah. um, he asked, 
Because the Higgs decays into photons, photons are massless, where does that extra energy go to? Um, it goes to the different particles in the collider, really. So it does, doesn't decay. It's a, basically, the two photons is a signature that we look at, but there's mass, a lot of mass, that goes to other things uh, that, that stays in the detector. So, this is, um, so do you see all of this extra stuff? That's a lot of particles doing their own thing. They don't like to hang around. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's exactly what we're trying to do. And I, there, I mean, it's not really the big, I mean, the reason why we try to do it is because in the beginning of the universe, things happened and then things fell apart. And they fell apart into how they are right now. So when we try to say that we're trying to recreate a big bang, it's that we're trying to simulate the same environment and see how matter behaves at those temperatures, at extremely high energy. Um, so the reason why we do that is because things behave very, very much differently. And, and we're able to see what, why do things develop the way that they do <coughs> instead of developing another way. Um, and so it gives us a deeper insight into how the relationship between different particles, the relationships of, of things that we're made up of. Um, but we're able to see more, more clearly, based on the theory, um, at those high energies because they, they're more fundamental.